got a great crowd here. Ken, Wita, thank you so very much for putting this together. This is a really impressive group. To our guests, bienvenue, benvenido, welcome. Um, for those of you not familiar with Wita and not familiar with the individuals in this room, this is a really impressive, this is a really important group. These are what we would refer to in academia um, as influencers. Okay, so these are these are folks who represent companies, trade associations, they represent jobs. There are a couple of journalists sprinkled in among them, but we'll, we'll forget them. And um, you are incredibly important for us because as the late Tip O'Neill, Speaker of the House, once said, all politics is local. And in this case, all economics is local, and trade policy, and in particular, the impact of trade agreements and foreign direct investment uh, has its impact at the local level. And, and sometimes here in Washington, uh, politicians who are based here may forget that. And so one of the things that we'd like to do this morning, one of the things I'd like to do this morning, um, I'm going to ask a question, I'm going to throw out two questions, and then what I really want to do is open the floor for questions from our, our audience. And, and you can see our, um, our sponsors here, and you can see the, the kinds of jobs that they create. Uh, the groups that they represent uh, create lots of jobs and lots of income across the United States and more than a few in uh, Canada and Mexico and this North American market. Uh, my questions are, are pretty straightforward and, and I'm going to ask you to, to uh, whoever wants to respond first, be my guest. Uh, focusing on this local regional issue, Obviously, you're, you are um, supporters of NAFTA, but from your perspective, from your state, your province, what is the single most important aspect of NAFTA to your state, to your province? And while we're looking at making some changes, what is the single thing that if you could change it, you would want to change it? What is the thing that you dislike the most or the thing that you believe needs to be updated or changed? Uh, who'd, like to, who'd like to go first? Come here, come here. Sure. Hello, everyone. Open markets create jobs. Closed markets kill jobs. That's what I would say first. And it's true all over the world. Those markets increase prices for people who have difficulties, economic difficulties in their lives. And as an export-driven economy, Quebec is obviously an export-driven economy. Of course, we need those export markets uh, to be there, and to be not only maintained, but improved. But it's also a signal to the world, in today's world, which is so unstable, keeping these regional blocks of open trade is of absolute importance. Now, when NAFTA was created, there was no Amazon, there was no Google, there was no digital, digital economy, so obviously it has to be adjusted to today's realities. That's something we should all be working on. Modernized, yes. Improved, yes. Imploded, no. Who will suffer? Any people here in this room? No. Ordinary people from the middle class of both countries, the three countries, suffer if NAFTA fails, so it cannot fail. You know, and lastly I would say, uh, uh, tongue in cheek, there is no such thing as a free trade agreement. There are trade agreements with exceptions and specificities that countries need to keep in order to keep their policies moving forward and their priorities moving forward as a nation or as a collection of communities. So modernizing it, Keeping each other's interests in perspective, being able to put yourself in the other person's shoes and understand what, why this is so important is of paramount importance. But overall, 
let's keep the markets open for the sake of our fellow citizens. So, uh, so to your first question, um, Ambassador, the what's the single most important thing? If I if I think about um, Ontario, clearly the auto sector and agriculture are uh, the the two big pillars that uh, that are very important in this NAFTA discussion. And I would say the single most important thing for us in that reality is the ability to innovate. The partnerships that um, we create regionally allow us to innovate and stay at the, the cutting edge of, uh, of those sectors. And I don't, I don't think that we can be as strong, and, and in order to be strong we have to continue to innovate, and I don't think we can do that without tapping into the whole region. So that, that tucks into what, uh, what we've all said about openness. But it is, for me, it's that innovation, because that's what's going to keep us competitive globally. And in terms of uh, the things that I would like to see change, I mean, I, I think what, uh, what we've all talked about in terms of the technologies, the, the gaps, the gaps that exist in NAFTA because of its age, I think those are the things that I would like to see, uh, I'd like to see dealt with. Um, Governor Hickenlooper, you talked about fairness. I think that to the extent that we can in this renewal, make sure that the, leving, the, the playing field is as level as possible. And I, you know, I'm not at the table, I'm not one of the negotiators, but I know that that's one of the things that all of our negotiators have a mandate to look for. But from my perspective, it is the gaps that exist because of the age of the agreement that we need to fill. Gracias. La primera pregunta, embajadora. Y yo no puedo imaginar un telecán del 94, donde los tres países había también incertidumbre por qué firmábamos eh, un acuerdo comercial eh, entre Estados Unidos, Canadá y México. Y no puedo pensar en que vamos a regresar a poner aranceles que teníamos en aquel entonces, aranceles del acero, aranceles a, al sector automotriz, aranceles al campo, a la agricultura, a la ganadería. Y se transformó 25 años después. Hoy en México, en Querétaro, nos hemos preparado. Y tenemos lo que denominamos la triple hélice. La triple hélice, fortalecer todas las universidades públicas y privadas en Querétaro con centros de investigación públicos y privados, con toda la industria. Y el gobierno nada más como facilitador. Y hoy esa triple hélice, eh, academia, investigadores e industria, tienen una economía... Eh, del 6% o una década completa, 10 años, 5.5% eh, sin romper. ¿Qué ha generado esto? Empleos de alta calidad, bien remunerados. En Querétaro se hace la innovación de las turbinas de Estados Unidos y emplea a 1.800 ingenieros en Querétaro. Bombardier 2.000 empleos eh, en el sector aeronáutico. Safran, los franceses, 2.200 empleos para el Mosor Lir, eh, que hoy es el más eh, vendido de todo el, el mundo. ITP, los españoles, hoy asociados con Rolls Royce, eh, los alemanes. Todo eso se hace en Querétaro. Eh, no podemos irnos para atrás. Tenemos que convencer eh, a todos de eh, no regres una regresión a aranceles y todo, todo lo contrario y termino. ¿Cómo lo vamos a actualizar? Hoy para Estados Unidos y para Canadá, México ofrece bajo una nueva legislación que en el 94 no teníamos. Estamos cerrados al sector energético. 
tenemos ya una nueva reforma energética donde pueden entrar eh, Estados Unidos y Canadá. Tenemos una nueva reforma en telecomunicaciones donde Estados Unidos hoy pueden entrar y eh, competir. México está totalmente abierto y en Querétaro abrimos cada vez más las puertas para todo eh, Estados Unidos y Canadá. Thank you, Abbas, uh, Gubernador. Uh, so when I was 21, for whatever reason, I, as a young person, was almost obsessed with Canada, Mexico, South America. I, long before I ever thought of going to France or Germany. When I was 21, I took a hitchhike up to Montreal. I had these two puppies, I built this makeshift cage, and we took the Canadian Pacific train across. And I got to stop and, and spend the night in places like Moose Jaw, uh, a long way from, uh, from Ontario. But a, an ex, you know, experience to see what Canada was and to meet so many Canadians. And then when I was uh, 24, I drove an old beat up Volkswagen, my brother was an automobile mechanic. I drove from California down through Nogales, across Mexico, all the way down to uh, Guatemala. And I was a young geology student. I worked there for almost a year. And that had created this affection, and real respect for these two companies that bound us and how similar we are. All three companies were melting pots. There are some people, I'm one of them, who believe that as people, when, when, when people are, are, are willing to leave their home country, their families, everything they know, and go out to a new country, uh, they are the true entrepreneurs, and I think there's a genetic code there that we all have inherited and remains to a, a large extent in our, in our DNA. And I think the, what NAFTA did was help us help each other. And have gone, I still, every chance I get, I try to uh, drive through Canada and Mexico, and the prosperity that we see in this continent is spectacular and in, in remarkable continue, can, 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 uh, I'm now I lost the word, uh, respect with respect to where we started from. Uh, so I think that's to me what is most important is the relation between the, the three countries and the recognition that our destiny is intertwined. Uh, what would I change? Uh, if, if there were a way to do it, and you know, Colorado is a center of NORAD, Northern Command, Space Command, uh, and we're, we have a, a Mexican relationship now, but it's not as strong as the relationship we have with Canada in terms of our national defense. I think all three countries can continue to grow into that relationship and ultimately become equal partners. It's not really NAFTA. If it was NAFTA, you know, Colorado is a big cheese manufacturing state, and, and so I probably want to negotiate a little bit about the cheese because we all have our, you know, our specific things that we think maybe aren't quite as fair as they were 22 years ago, but I don't think that's the role of us today. No, that's, that, that works. I think Jaime I think, I think Castaneda would probably agree. Uh, totally. <laughs> <laughs> He's with you. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much for your answers. Gracias, merci. And I'm going to turn to this audience, although Ken, how... how so uh, the ground rules, we ask folks to please identify themselves, uh, say their name, their affiliation, and we have a ground rule at WIDA, which is uh, to keep your question short and ask your question in the form of a question, if you Yes. We have, a, we have a mic runner who will come around. Merrily, international trade today. This is for the premier of Quebec and the premier of Ontario. We've uh, focused a lot on NAFTA, but of course there's another question looming, which is the question of Section 232. And I know that you make a lot of airplanes and aircraft engines in Quebec, and obviously the auto industry is enormous in Ontario. And I just wanted to know what you're talking about with you governors today about the ways that some kind of tariff or quota system for aluminum and steel would affect your interdependent businesses like Pratt & Whitney and like uh, GM. Uh, thank you. First, uh, facts, 60% uh, uh, of uh, the aluminum imported from Canada to the US comes from Quebec. Uh, the reason for that is that we have ample hydroelectric resources and that's the reason we have uh, settled the uh, aluminum industry in, uh, in Quebec. 
When I speak about aluminum, I always like to refer to the North American, as the government mentioned, security perimeter. Aluminum is a very, very strategic metal. Uh, we should view our continent as, uh, as a unit, and we should view steel and aluminum, and particularly aluminum, as a strategic product that should travel freely uh, between the two countries. Uh, I, mean, I know that a lot of people are talking about this. Our unions on both sides of the border are working together on this as well. Uh, as for the aerospace industry, because you mentioned it in your introduction, of course, everybody has uh, followed the, uh, the Bombardier Boeing uh, issue in, in the recent weeks. It's always worth remembering that the C series of uh, Bombardier, which was at the heart of the issue, has 53% of its components procured in the US. Thousands of jobs actually in the US are linked to the C series. So we should be very careful in you know, overarching statements or summaries. Uh, which are by nature imperfect about the complexity of this relationship. So I was happy to see the outcome of it. You can guess, of course I was. But we should carry on and work together. And the aluminum issue, I think, is closely related, as was mentioned, to the aerospace. And again, the solution is to view it as a strategic element of our global North American perimeter of security. Well, I will just, um, I'll just reinforce what uh, Philippe has said about the regional nature of, uh, of uh, I think, uh, a healthy relationship or a healthy um, uh, steel market. I mean, I, some, of the, some of the challenges that, um, that these changes are intended to resolve are challenges that we're facing as well. So I think having a, having a, a, a steel uh, regime North American wide makes a lot more sense in terms of dealing with other countries that maybe uh, it's a dumping issue that we need to we need to look at it as a, as a North American challenge and put in place a, a North American market that would be I think and I've, I've advocated for that for some time Ontario's a steel producer we you know we have uh, lots of capacity where our electricity system is 90% um, greenhouse gas emission free. It's a clean, it's a clean production, and I think that uh, we would be much better off to have that uh, regional regime in terms of uh, of the steel. Uh, I'm going to take, oops, I'm going to take two more questions. Uh, I'm going to take three more questions, uh, but I'm going to take the questions uh, first, and then uh, invite our guests to uh, respond to the ones they feel like responding to. <laughs> Sorry, that was not subtle. <laughs> That's okay, it's a short question. Uh, Bill Lane with Trade for America. The, um, the question is how do you define fairness? Um, is it fair processes, is it fair rules, or is it fair outcomes? And I just say that recognizing that on a per capita basis, Canadians buy eight times more American products than the other way around and Mexicans buy twice as much American products than the other way around. So is the problem trade, or is the problem we need more Canadians and Mexicans? Rodrigo del Gobierno de Querétaro. Gobernador, puede darnos un ejemplo muy concreto. Governor, uh, Rodrigo, from Querétaro, Governor. Mm -hmm. De la evolución. Could you give us an example? Puede yes. seguir hablando. Ok. Gobernador, puede darnos un ejemplo muy concreto de la evolución de la vocación productiva en Querétaro a partir de la entrada del NAFTA. Since the NAFTA came into force. Thank you, uh, Jean-François Boitin with uh, CP Think Tank in Paris. And I have a question about what might come out at the end of the uh, negotiating process, which is a review um, every, whatever, five, three, ten years of NAFTA. Would it make sense to have a group of governors and premiers like you are being part of that review process to bring a little more common sense in the debates. Thank you, John. Okay. 
maybe on, on fairness, it's a very interesting issue. It's a little bit like beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder, I'd say. You know, it's, it's, well, uh, the answer to the fairness issue is not the size of the trade balance, deficit, or surplus. It's a wrong way to assess fairness. Uh, the answer is the quality and value of the jobs created out of the commercial relationship. And also the understanding on the other parties' uh, social and political realities. Uh, we were uh, discussing earlier tangentially agriculture in our opening statements, but for us this is a critical social and political and supply management system in the industry particularly, and also for Quebec the cultural industry has a very, very different meaning that these may have in other uh, parts of the, uh, of the Federation or North America. And lastly, it should be appreciated by our American friends like Canada, like the U.S. is a federation, but it's a much more decentralized federation than the U.S. is. And on issues such as agriculture, culture, and others, there is no way a deal can be obtained without the consent of the provinces. Even if it's not legally enshrined, the political reality is such that fairness also will be judged by the way and how much provinces, states, subnational states have been involved. I want to just um, I want to speak to the review issue. Um, I think that I think that it does make sense that there would be some mechanism or understanding that there needs to be a systematic way of triggering a review or looking at uh, looking at change. I think what is problematic and would create really undue uncertainty would be uh, an expiry date. And I think that's, I think that was, uh, that was the reaction, or it was a reaction to that that uh, created a, um, a real ripple in Ontario. So that uncertainty would be unacceptable, but do I think that there, you know, there needs to be some systematic approach to reviewing? I think that we could all agree that we're 25 years in and what has triggered this review is not a systematic or rational process. And so if there were a more rational way of, that was not a political comment, but, <laughs> but if there were a way to have a more rational trigger, I think that, that would make sense. Just not, not to create the uncertainty of this is going to be blown up every five years and start all over again. I'm going to refer to the fairness aside from being a politician, my family and I are hog raisers, swine raisers in Querétaro. We have 54,000, uh, our herd of, of hogs is 54,000. What do our hogs actually eat? 100% del maíz Estados Unidos. And, uh, the, the corn they eat is from the U.S. El 100% de la soya of the soy Estados Unidos. is U.S. produced. La genética the genetics is 100% Canadian. Can, Canadian. <laughs> la tecnología. The technology, the technology. La tecnología is Canadian and American. It's both Canadian and American. Y nosotros nada más ponemos el recurso humano. And we, just the human resources is what Mujeres, we bring the trabajadoras y trabajadores. The workers. De los 365 días del año. It's 364 days y of year they have their working we provide for. Igual de calidad, hoy de carne, de cerdo. And que se ponen en un plato en Estados Unidos. En and the quality is the same as any, any, any pork. pork. It's exactly, <laughs> igual. it's exactly the same quality. Para mí esa es una equidad. And that, to me, ejemplo, is fairness. Y para contestar, eh, la pregunta, and antes, eh, to answer the cal, question about before NAFTA y después, and after esta posible revisión, this para que potential Estado review. Ha sido en esta preparación, yo hablé del sector aeronáutico I was, del Estado de Querétaro. I spoke about the aeronautic sector of the state in my remarks of the state of Querétaro. En solo diez años. In only 10 years. Porque antes de diez años. Because before then. Solo estaba ITP los españoles en Querétaro. Just the Spaniards, one company was in Querétaro. En diez años hay ochenta industrias aeronáuticas. In 10 years now there are 80 companies in Querétaro from all over the world. Y hoy solo Querétaro. 
solo el, el estado de Querétaro, lo comenté, somos el cuarto atractor de inversión extranjera We're the directa fourth del mundo. Highest draw of investors in the world in this sector. Porque tenemos eh, capacidad de calidad. Because the, our, it's because of our capacity of quality of human resources. Mujeres y hombres preparados para train men and women dar esa innovación to bring about this innovation. Como, como se dice hoy, manufactura y mente factura. You say manufacture, well, we say that we had mind you factor. Um, that's a tough act to follow. Um, I would say, just in terms of the fairness, I think I think more about process. Uh, we have a lot of hogs. We raise a lot of hogs in Colorado, and there is always going to be self-interest in negotiations around any kind of trade agreement. Uh, as we become more, something that's louder. As we, come, as we become more effective in, our lobbyists become more effective in pinpointing every little benefit or every additional cost to their specific businesses, the process gets harder. But ultimately, I think we should all agree that the goal is the greatest good for the greatest number of people. We want to make sure that the economies of all three countries are strong and, if possible, growing. Uh, that we want to make sure that there is a shared a shared destiny that, that, that each country embraces and allows to direct their, you know, each, each agreement is always going to be filled with compromise. And that, that's one of the reasons why we don't want to do it every five years. It takes a tremendous amount of time and relationships. If you meet somebody, once you have an acquaintance, uh, you meet them a few times, you begin to have a, a relationship. I mean, trade agreements create family, long-term friendships on many, many levels. Uh, and the last question about whether there are more govs, there should be more governors and per premiers in the process. Absolutely. And I think the National Governors Association and the associations of both uh, Mexico and Canada around premiers and governors are working to figure out how do we get more governors together and, and begin looking at what, how would we go about this. And I, I'm a great believer in terms of the process to get the most closely affected people in a process in the same room and let them create the draft. Don't present them with the draft ahead of time because then it's always a suspicion of bias. You know, we did uh, fugitive emissions in Colorado four years ago, uh, methane, in, uh, methane regulation. And we had the environmental community and we had the oil and gas industry in the, same bill in the same room for 13 months. And neither side enjoyed it. It was a lot of hard work. These are people that don't play well together usually. But in the end, they all stood around the podium and, and viewed this as a great success for them. And I think the same thing's possible in trades. We just really have to get the, the parties in the room and let's start from ground zero, not every five years, but let's say every 10 or 15 or maybe every 20 years, and look at what is the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Let me, let me uh, thank our panelists for these very compelling responses. I think, uh, Governor Dominguez, your very tangible story, your very tangible anecdote, um, and our premiers and Governor Hickenlooper, uh, the, the more granular details, your politicians, you know that that kind of granularity, that kind of specificity, uh, tends to be the most compelling when you're making a case. And I would vote for every one of you to